But I think the level of anxiety and depression we're seeing among us is unacceptable and we should not be comfortable with those numbers. Hi, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm Adri Corti. The goal of my YouTube channel is to make academia entertaining and accessible for you. So if that sounds good, please make sure to subscribe and hit the little bell so you always get notifications every time I post. So today is part one of a two-part series where I will be talking about mental health in graduate school and the current mental health status of many graduate students. Before I get started, I just want to put a little disclaimer that I am a PhD student trying to get my PhD in biology. I am not a mental health expert or trying to give you any advice. Um, about interventions for your own mental health. I'm just gonna be going over some of the literature about mental health in graduate students and also talking about some of my opinions. But again, I am not a medical professional. So I think the conversation about mental health in academia and mental health among graduate students is actually sort of new. So I found this publication from 2018 that I'm gonna talk about a little bit that seemed like it was not like groundbreaking, but it did seem to start like a pretty intense conversation about this because of their findings. So it is kind of a newer thing people are talking about. Obviously, I'm sure there has been mental health problems among graduate students forever, but it's nice that the conversation is now like more public and there seems hopefully to be less of a stigma about having sort of like bad mental health in graduate school. What I'm gonna be talking about today is the mental health crisis among graduate students. I'm gonna talk about some of the interventions within the literature that they think should be made to make graduate students' mental health better. And then I'm gonna talk about some of my own opinions about some of the interventions that I think are actually really missing and that we need to highlight way more to try to help graduate students have better mental health. But there is sort of this weird culture that I've noticed in academia where bad mental health sort of seems like it comes with the job. Like it's very normal to see like people's mental health degrade as they go through grad school. I'd say on average like a fifth year is probably less optimistic than a first year. <laughs> I don't have any data for that, but it just sort of seems like it's what we see. Does bad mental health just come along with being in graduate school? Or can our mental health actually be improved? And this is actually shouldn't be an expected thing that comes along with being an academic, with getting your PhD, with getting your master's. So the first paper I'm gonna talk about is called An Evidence for a Mental Health Crisis in Graduate Education. And it was published in March, 2018. So I wanna like note that because it's actually two years before COVID started. And I imagine a lot of these issues that people had <laughs> that made their mental health bad from being in grad school, I'm sure were exacerbated during COVID. And so basically this study, they surveyed over 2000 different people in graduate school. 90% of them were in PhD programs and 10% were master's students. So they use these two like clinically validated scales to measure anxiety and depression. Um, and so they sent out this survey with those different scales that they're gonna use to basically diagnose people. Um, and so this is via social media and them just like emailing people. And so the respondents were from 26 different countries and over 200 different institutions. And there were people mostly from the humanities and social sciences to a lesser degree from like biological and physical sciences to an even lesser degree engineering. And then like a few others that they just name other. And so basically want to figure out were our graduate students like more depressed, more anxious than what you would expect from just the general population of people. And so I'm going to show you some of the data that they talk about. The, the main finding here is that graduate students are six times as likely to experience depression and anxiety as compared to the general population. So what they're showing in this uh, figure 1a is that among the graduate students they asked, 
41% said they had anxiety and 39% said they had depression. Um, and so that seems to me to be a pretty large number. And this is just from the people they surveyed, but again, from the general population, you would expect those numbers to be about 6%. Like among the people that they looked at, was there like an overrepresentation of one certain group based on their gender identity? You can see here the anxiety among the people that were surveyed that transgender people are overrepresented. They seem to be uh, experiencing it even more than um, people who identify as male and female. And then also the same is true for depression. And so this is pretty concerning. It seems like you know, graduate students are not doing well in terms of depression and anxiety, and this seems to also have to do with their gender identity. They've established now that there's this problem, <laughs> and now they're like, okay, but why is there a problem? Um, and I could name a few things. I'm sure any graduate student watching this could just like name 10 things right now why our graduate students have bad mental health. Like, it's very obvious to us. <laughs> so, some of the stuff in this study is so obvious that I'm like, I can't even believe that you had to study this. Like, the result is so obvious but we are scientists so we have to make hypotheses and we have to test them and then show the data even if the result seems very obvious. One thing they looked at was work-life balance. Among the anxious people about 56% of them answered that they had a bad work-life balance compared to 24% that said it was good. And then with depression, they said, you know, 55% uh, said that they had bad work-life balance compared to 21%. And so then they also want to look at, well, what about your relationship with your PI, with your mentor? So what we're seeing in panel D is that people with anxiety and depression are basically saying that they disagree more with the statements that their mentor provides, actual mentorship, that pro they provide ample support, that they provide positive emotional impact that the mentor is an asset to their career and that they feel actually valued by their mentor. So you can see the numbers here. You know, it seems like almost half disagree with the statement. You're not having a positive relationship with your mentor. That is also negatively affecting your mental health. Another thing that seems very obvious to me and I feel like to other graduate students that would watch this, that of course that would correlate with having worse mental health. And so then the next thing in the paper, they're like, we have this problem, so how are we gonna intervene? Like, what do we do to make graduate students' mental health better? And I will say what they bring up to me seems very weird. Okay, so we need to enhance access to mental health support. Obviously that on its own, I'm like, well, yeah, that's great. Like if people can easily go to a counselor, can easily go to a therapist, like there's not a lot of financial barriers or barriers of it taking a long time or they have to wait forever. That's awesome. That's not what they're talking about here. They think that the career development offices can also serve students when it comes to mental health. Like, I did not understand why they would think that a career development office and a mental health support office should be integrated. Like, I hear more and more about work-life integration instead of work-life balance. I personally think I like the balance better. I like that those two things are separate and that I have more of an emphasis on my actual life versus my work. I feel like the work-life integration is trying to make them equal. And in my eyes, I don't think they should be equal. And so this kind of feels like that too, like the work-life integration that like, you know, let's put mental health with the career development resources to improve your productivity. And I don't think that's always a solution, obviously, to a lot of mental health problems is that we need to improve productivity or we need to find you a better career. I don't even... I guess I don't fully understand what they mean by this. I didn't think it was explained well. Yeah, I think those two things should probably be separate. And then they say faculty should be educated about, you know, graduate student mental health. But also in this paper, they're like, faculty like our PIs and mentors should be trained by mental health professionals so they can start to see the signs of like a mental health crisis and then intervene. I don't know what you guys think about that. I think it's a little weird. I don't need my... PI to be trained by a mental health expert to notice the signs of anxiety, to notice the signs of depression, to then intervene and help me. That feels very personal and like it's sort of taking down a barrier of like privacy between your boss and you. What I really want is for the environment of the lab to be one that is obviously supportive of self-care. I think just by creating an environment where I can message him and be like, I won't be coming in today. I don't have to say I won't be coming in today because I feel anxious. I don't have to say I won't be coming in today because I feel sick. That you can simply be like, I am just not going to be there today. And they don't ask. They're like, okay, 
you know, within reason. That's all I need is the environment. I don't need him to be a therapist. The paper says creating a tone of self-care. If the lab can just create the tone of self-care, then I think that will help graduate students take time off on their own, be able to have time off to go get help for their mental health. At the end of the paper, they're like, we need additional studies to investigate intervention strategies that could address mental health crisis in the graduate trainee population. Okay, I totally agree with that. I do think the thing with this paper is that they're missing a lot of the factors. It obviously is not comprehensive and they don't claim that it is, but I do think that there could have been a lot more factors they could look at. You know, it's just a survey you're sending out that I would have added a lot more questions to try to make correlations between other things in graduate school that could be affecting someone's mental health. In addition to your gender identity, your relationship with your mentor, and your work-life balance. So I kept looking at the literature because I want to see what other factors affect graduate student mental health. And so I found this paper from 2021. So this is, you know, during COVID. Um, and this woman, Caitlin Cooper, was really interested in the paper that I just went over. So she wanted to basically send out another survey and look at some other things that could affect graduate student mental health. Her and her lab do this study with like 50 different, specifically life sciences, PhD students from 28 institutions. And they're basically trying to find more factors that contribute to someone's like having bad mental health. They go into a lot of research related factors because their paper specifically found out that people had a lot of negative things to say about research, more positive things to say about teaching. Like people seem to get a lot of like serotonin and and good feedback and return on their investment from teaching and a lot less of that from doing research. And if you do research, you understand that literally a thousand percent. It's sort of the nature of doing like biology and perturbing like an actual living system and then, you know, trying to measure something. It's very hard. It comes with a lot of failure. Things take a long time and you don't get a lot of return for your investment. You can invest 20 hours in doing something and get no good data from it, not learn anything new from it. You know, not actually everything is a learning experience. Some things just suck. <laughs> So, you know, that is sort of the nature of research. Some of it's awesome, like when something does work, it's like the best feeling ever. And building a story is awesome and asking questions, be able to explore that is great. So there's good and bad sides, but it seems like PhD students are saying more negative things about research than like teaching. Some of the negative things they're talking about that are research related are like I said, like failures, obstacles, setbacks. You end up comparing yourself to other people in your lab, to other people in your program. Um, that definitely happens. Some people do their PhD in three, four years, get five first other publications, and they're off to be a PI in two years. You know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it takes people eight, 10, you know, that's a lot maybe seven years, hopefully, is the most, to get their PhD. It takes them a really long time to get their first publication. But there's so many different circumstances that make those things happen. So it's really not good to compare yourself to other people that have a completely different experience than you. Um, and then social isolation. And that can be really hard for people. Sometimes it's hard for me. Um, you know, I'll go a whole day and be like, I barely said any words today. Like I was so busy doing my individual work. So, you know, that can start to be taxing. So you really need to make sure that you are making an effort to go out and talk to your friends and get out of the lab. Uh, they also talked about where unstructured research experiences, negative reinforcements or your PI, you know, sort of saying maybe abusive and rude things to you, and then unreasonable or overwhelming expectations. What they say can positively affect your depression in terms of different like research related things is completing small or concrete research tasks. So within like an overarching experiment, I might put smaller tasks within that of like label the tubes, do this easy thing, just so that I can check it off at the end of the day. That actually does, at the end of the day, help me feel better that I have this whole list of things that I've checked off, even if it's like little things that I did. So I think it's important to not make these giant to-do lists where it's like, you know, get data for the paper would be like your task for the day. That's a really big task. So you could say smaller things within that, like make the solution that I'm gonna use for this experiment, label the tubes, things that you can easily check off. And then you eventually get there and you get to check off every day. Another thing that positively affected people's depression was working with other people 
people. Sometimes you can control that. You can like make collaborations if you're able to do that. Sometimes just taking a break and going to talk to somebody in your lab about something that's not related to science or just something that is related to science, even if they're not working on your project, you can ask a question or even I complain all the time about my things not working to my friend in the lab and she's always supportive. Um, and then another one, that positively affects your depression is having emotionally supportive PI. And so we saw with the other study that many of the people that were anxious and depressed also said that they did not have a great relationship with their PI. When you're looking for a lab, you wanna be looking for a PI that seems emotionally supportive. You wanna to talk to graduate students within that lab and ask them how supportive are they of you professionally, of your mental health, like of your physical well-being. Once you get into a lab, it is a relationship with a person, so it's going to need some shaping to be good. They're in a position of power. They're deciding when you're gonna graduate. There's a lot going on there, so you might get annoyed sometimes Sometimes you might be like, man, we meet way too much. Like they're kind of micromanaging me and you can sort of shift your behavior and hopefully there can shift theirs a little bit to see what works for both of you within the confines of like a healthy relationship with your PI. Outside of a healthy relationship with PI, I think you gotta get out of there. Like if they're saying abusive things to you, it's not constructive criticism, it's just criticism. Like that might be an abusive relationship where you don't wanna try to mold yourself to fit in with how they work because it's in the confines of an abusive relationship. So you probably just need to get out of there because it's really not worth it to sacrifice your mental health to get your PhD. We've talked about graduate students having a mental health crisis. We've talked about like some reasons why, which include like bad work-life balance, bad relationships with your PI, unstructured research experience, social isolation, like there's all these things. But even after all of this, there is still something to me that is really, really missing. So we need to keep looking. And so I found this really nice um, infographic called Mental Health During Your PhD, The Toxic Mix. And it was created by Dr. Zoe uh, Aries, and I'll put her social media down below. And so let's go through this and see some other things that could negatively affect your mental health within graduate school. So some of the, these things we've seen before, like first time failing, you know, we talked about failure. You get used to failure to some extent. It de never feels good, but also that very first time failing and you realize this is something I'm gonna have to deal with all the time. That can really be a blow, obviously, to your mental health. So we've talked about what she calls presenteeism, which I think is that you feel like you always need to be present, like it's a bad work-life balance. We've talked about like tough relationships. Like again, you know, with in a healthy relationship, you can figure out what works for both of you and make it work. But within like an abusive relationship, that's something that you probably need to exit from and that can take a toll on you for sure. We've talked about what she's calling the no more tick boxes. She's pointing out that in college, it was like, you know, I have these courses, ticking them off, I need to do these assignments. But once you get to grad school, it's this like giant unstructured thing and you need to get from beginning grad school to publishing. And some of that sort of path is very nebulous and abstract. So that can be very daunting and poor for your mental health as well. So we have talked a little bit about like the competitive landscape where you can start to compare yourself to people around you because, you know, a lot of us are going for the same sort of funding. We're, we start at the same time and we do notice when people leave before us, so if people are taking a long time, like there is this sort of competition within academia that can be bad for your mental health. Another one we haven't really talked about is imposter syndrome. And so check out my video here where I talk about imposter syndrome. I talk a lot about how I think that this is more of a cultural problem versus an individual problem of having imposter syndrome, but check that video out. And so then another one she talks about is called papers, please. This focus on this productivity and research output can be really stressful because you're trying to always publish, which means you need like good data, you need a story, you're always trying to get the next publication out. So like your output is really important and it goes back to failing all the time. Like if your output's not going well and you're not making progress, you're not getting those publications, like it can become really stressful. Something I talked about in the beginning is what she's calling this culture of acceptance. But this is how we accept that bad mental health sort of comes with the territory of academia, with the territory of getting your PhD. And we need to sort of 
get that out of our minds because if we accept that, oh, con conditions are just bad, we're just gonna feel bad, then I think we're less inclined to fight that feeling and to find ways for us to feel better if we just think it's part of it. Like, it should not be part of graduate school. It's a stressful environment. I'm not saying it, it's not gonna be stressful. We can't make it like cupcakes and rainbows and taking naps every day. I'm not suggesting that, but I think the level of anxiety and depression we're seeing among us is unacceptable and we should not be comfortable with those numbers. Something we haven't really talked about yet, which I'm sort of shocked by, is financial concerns. Literally, I was shook. This, I'm almost done with this video and this is the first time we're gonna be talking about this. This is the only time I've seen, you know, within these, the literature I've looked at so far, which is not comprehensive, but it's nothing about financial concerns of graduate students. Like, oh my goodness, I was shocked to see that in the last two papers I talked about that this was not talked about. Like, it's just so crazy to me that that sometimes seems to be ignored. Like in this infographic, she specifically talks about reimbursement issue for graduate students. We go to conferences, you have to pay for like travel, you have to pay for food, you have to pay for a place to stay, you have to pay for the actual cost of the conference, and then you get reimbursed. But for a lot of people, it's very hard to front a thousand dollars and then get reimbursed weeks later because you don't have that kind of money and you can't go without that kind of money for that long. So that can be really challenging. But another thing too is just that we are not paid that well. When we first come in, I think the shock of being paid at all to get an advanced degree is amazing. Like I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to go into debt. Like they're gonna pay me. And that was like blinders. I was just thankful. But then as you continue on and you're doing all of this work and you're creating something for the university, you're like, I would like to be paid more actually. Like the blinders come off and you're like, thanks for paying me. I'd like some more actually to deal with cost of living, to be able to pay for dental and eye healthcare that you don't give me. Like you start to see that, wow, I'm actually should be paid more. I'm not a mental health expert, like I said, but like the financial concerns is the number one thing for me when I think about mental health in grad school. Like that first study I showed, I think they could have done so much cool stuff with the data, bringing up different financial factors. Like, do you feel like you can go to the doctor affordably? Do you feel like you can get your teeth clean? Do you feel like you can go get your eyes checked without going broke? How many people do you live with? How far away do you live from campus? Like. You could get more information about how anxiety and depression sort of correlates with someone's socioeconomic status within grad school. Maybe that would have been a hard thing to do, but I think that was something that has been totally missed about how us having financial concerns and not being paid that well definitely contributes to our mental health problems. And maybe, you know, pay us more, it wouldn't get rid of anxiety and depression, but oh my goodness, I suspect that it would alleviate it a good amount. <laughs> because I know people say more money, more problems, whatever. I, okay, let's try it though. Just pay us more and see what happens. But so in part two, I'm gonna be talking more about the financial concerns that can cause bad mental health, I think, within graduate school, or, you know, stack on to already having poor mental health, and then it's like, oh, I'm not being paid that well either. So I'll talk about increasing pay as an intervention to improve mental health. I'll talk about some concrete evidence to convince you that we actually are not paid very well, and there's data out there to support that. I'll also talk about this sort of idea in the context of being at Vanderbilt and what's happening at Vanderbilt right now. And I'll also talk about if there's a correlation between poverty and bad mental health. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching. Prioritize your mental health. If you're in a lab, if you're in a space where that can't happen, if you have the means, I say get out. It might be worth it in the end um, to just be in a happier place and like a healthier mindset during your PhD. So stay tuned for my next video. You don't want to miss it. Make sure to subscribe and I will see you guys next time. Bye.